Uh, in the spirit of the event, I got back uh, yesterday also from, from Paris, and uh, I realized I'd probably drank and slept a little bit too much on the plane, so I hadn't prepared my uh, talk on compromise. Uh, so I changed the talk last night, uh, and I'm completely talking about something different. And I really didn't have a chance to, to revise it at all, so uh, there'll be frequent changes throughout the talk. Um, I just want to say, though, uh, what I think a lot of what Kevin uh, mentioned was really, I really believe in. Um, but rather than take his approach and actually give you advice that you can use, I'll sort of be talking about uh, things I think are important for you to be conscious of as students about uh, the world of tomorrow and how I think, or rather I predict it will change. So first I really want to talk about how we ended up with the education system we have today. So this idea of education started off with the Greeks, arguably, as an institution, and it was really to get citizenship. It wasn't to specialize or to go to university. It was to learn a series of things you needed to become a citizen, to live in the state of Greece and to vote and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and it really began and ended, education as a right, began and ended with the Greeks. And after that, actually, we, we saw guilds. So people basically did what their father did. It was really just their father. Woman, unfortunately, didn't work for the next uh, 2,000 years, basically. Um, and, and it was one-to-one. -one. So that was it, 20, 30 years of investing your time, passing down a skill, and you'd repeat the process. And we really only saw a change to the system in 1850 or around then with the Industrial Revolution. And suddenly, uh, a lot, I know Ken, Ken Robinson gives a much better talk about this, but uh, it's important to note that the motives behind setting up schools weren't purely to get kids into factories. There were good people behind these who, who believed that every child had a certain right to be able to read, to be able to, to, do, to do mass, whatever they had uh, importance for last, uh, back then. Um, more importantly, the 1850s were the first time that a career or industry became a part of education. So before then, either a career was assumed, you did what your dad did, uh, or, or it was as a right with the Greeks. And suddenly over here, you had this incredible pace of innovation, incredible pace of change, and people quickly realized there weren't enough people who could do jobs. So there was a minimum amount of skill you would be required to have to be able to do these jobs. And since the 1850s, I would argue that education has evolved hand in hand with work that often, in fact, education is more influenced by getting people into jobs than it is by, say, uh, as a right or as, as culture or as liberal arts. So then we were sort of, right, so here, factories, yeah. Um, this is a school in the 1950s. I find the 1950s fascinating because it was really the first time that this concept of grades was introduced. Uh, before then, really, nobody cared about grades, but in the 1950s, America just led this amazing innovation uh, and, and, and technological revolution, and there just weren't enough people uh, to, to work in those jobs, and more importantly, they required specialization. So if you had a class of 30 students and you needed to figure out who would be the doctor, who would be the, I don't know, the engineer, or whatever have you, you gave them grades to help them identify where they might go, but in, instead of helping them, it was really about helping the economy. So you give this student an A, and therefore they have the opportunity to study engineering, and therefore they became an engineer. And that system of grades, I find uh, kind of antiquated. Uh, and, th and there's an interesting slide I'll, sh I'll show you in a second. But the grades phenomena has only grown in the last 50 or 60 years. However, right now we're starting to question whether grades are really that important, whether they mean that much in education. Again, so that's about specialization. And note that the world that the students of the 1950s were going into, so much more complexity than I can describe, but definitely more, more specialization required than the, than the 1850s. And that pace of specialization, as technology improves, just accelerates. I mean, they say every nine years, the number of scientific papers doubles. And each of those papers presents potentially a new industry. So maybe these students over here were walking into, say, a couple thousand industries, potentially. Today, there are a couple million. So this is a, the classroom of, of today. Um, and I feel like we're reaching a point now where we're really questioning what the purpose of education is. Do we go back to those, those values 2,000 years ago, um, at least in the West, where education was seen as a right, a way to enter the world, a way to think critically, uh, a way to develop a personality, or is it really much more pragmatic than that? Is it about getting a job? So here you go, um, this is another inter interesting trend. So wh why is this question so much more important today than it was you know, 100 and, or 200 years ago? 200 years ago, you, you're basically a farmer, and, and everybody else had a specialization, was a blacksmith, that sort of thing. And you can see that today nobody's a farmer. That's a big yellow area there. Oh, pardon me, the agriculture at the bottom. And everybody does everything else above that. And, and really, the green and the blue combined, they, com they, they constitute what's called the, uh, the economy of doing. So this is where actual human beings are required to you know, use their bodies to do jobs. 
And the yellow area is basically the, the thinking economy. This is where we don't need to waste our time doing, doing the manual labor. There are machines to do that. Instead, we, we use our brains to make the world a better place, to move on forward, to progress. Um, and that's really important to realize because I want to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. So here we go. You can see the sort of correlation. This is just from Google. I, I pulled it up about 20 minutes ago. Um, you can see that interest in careers is, is growing far quickly, at least in references and articles and books, that sort of thing, uh, compared to grades. People sort of losing interest in, in, in knowing what the importance of grades are. And, you know, entrepreneurial leaders or whoever will tell you the first thing, like, uh, grades aren't important anymore. Uh, I mean, following things like your passion are, uh, for reasons I want to get into in a sec. One, like, kind of curious thing is, you know, that this is a classroom in the 1850s, this is a classroom in the 1950s, and this is a classroom in the 2000s. So the structure of education has essentially remained the same. And if you're interested in, in learning why that is, I would recommend Ken Robinson's talk uh, at one of the TED events. So is it working? We've now given students grades, they go to university, and that's where they specialize. So basically 18 years of, of your life, you're trying to figure out what you might be good at, and then you go and, and, you go and do that in depth, and you get a job. Well, the answer is yes, it definitely is working. And here you can see a, a general education index. So the more educated people are, that's further to the right, and the higher the GDP. So over here, there's a very strong correlation. Countries where people aren't very educated, you tend to see a lower income. And up there at the very top, people are very well educated, and there's a higher income. So there's no doubt that the system of grades has worked. Economies have done much better for it. So there's something going right there. This is another example. This is literally university enrollment. So if we kind of accept that the first 18 years of your life are about validating what you could do, then the real specialization and where you get work and where you get careers takes place in university. I'm guessing you guys have, oh, you're over that hump for the guys in, who are seniors. Uh, you don't have to worry about uni anymore, but a lot of you are working towards that. That's really what's on your mind when you think of grades, when you think of education. And this there, again, there's a strong correlation. Uh, I don't know why this graph follows career, uh, but there you go. You can see as the, the university enrollment increased, the GDP per capita, how much the average person was, was earning, went up. Now, this is, this is the first problem in education. We spend 18 years of our lives validating our interests in 12 subjects. But we know that every day new industries are created and every day new jobs are created. And, and the process of education today is just so funny, right? I mean, you spend 18 years doing, doing, doing education. And it's a mix of, of really good things, right? People, people who work in education care deeply about what they do, their jobs. But then we say this is a finite ending point. This is where education stops and this is where work begins. And suddenly you have you know, like a degree in history or something and you have to go out and find one of several million types of jobs. Not just jobs, types of jobs in different, you know, in all sorts of different fields, etc. So this to me seems strange. We have a world which has had more opportunity than ever before, but we have fewer tools uh, than ever before to sort of explore what those opportunities are. Uh, and, and that's very important. This is the Terminator. And this is <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, became governor of California, so follow your passions, I guess. Um, this is what people imagine artificial intelligence will look like. Robots perhaps coming from the future, back to our time. Um, but, but actually, artificial intelligence is, is uh, far more boring. It, it kind of looks like this. Um, artificial intelligence is also the wrong word. It's designed intelligence. It's intelligence we design. It has very, very limited ability to do what it does. Uh, and essentially, it does one job with a lot of data and a lot of rules very well. Now, people talk about the computerization of jobs. In the 1850s, they said, all jobs are going to go to the Industrial Revolution. They're called Luddites. It never happened. Job, the number of jobs only just increased. Over here, the situation is a little different. It's hard to say what's going to happen. But what we're essentially saying here is jobs where there are a lot of data and a lot of rules could be computerized. To give you an example, today there are 70 million jobs in transportation, taxi drivers, lorry drivers, pilots, that sort of thing. Um, the, the software exists today to replace that, all those jobs. And uh, it's safer. It's more reliable. It puts less stress on engines, so you have lo longevity of your vehicles. So, so and, and also, if you look at the industry as a whole, about 60% of costs, if you own a taxi company, 60% of your costs are human costs. So if you're a business owner and you have software that can do the job better, would you replace a driver? Right now, the answer is, is no. It's mainly political. For example, I was in, when I was in Paris, I was waiting to get petrol, just driving along, and it took us half an hour to get petrol. And eventually, we went there, the petrol machine put petrol in the car, they wouldn't accept a credit card because the unions protested that. So instead, you had a lady, a poor lady, actually, at the, at the very end, trying to you know, handle all these anxious drivers trying to pay for their petrol. So there's, there's a political reason that hasn't happened yet, but there's no economic reason. And economics always wins. Uh, I won't talk too much about how, how this artificial intelligence actually works, but it basically copies the way the brain processes patterns to a very rudimentary level, a very basic level. 
So basically, we finally started to create machines that think like humans and process patterns like humans and learn. So, yeah, there are organizers over here. So there's one thing I wanted to show you. I, have any of you heard of Deep Dream? Raise your hands if you've heard of Deep Dream. So Deep Dream was an initiative by Google where they basically reversed one of those networks, neural networks I showed you before, to see if it, a computer could be creative. Creativity is almost consciousness to some, to some degree. I think it would be a real uh, long shot to say that computers think consciously in, in this case. But essentially, they give the computer an image and they say, what do you think this looks like? And you get a result that kind of looks like this. It took me four hours to process this. It look, requires a lot of computer power. Um, and basically, you can see all parts of the image. There's a dog up there on the right. On the left, I have no idea what's going on. There seems to be an eye right in the middle here. Um, so basically, the computer starts looking through the image, and it does art. And that means that we're, we're getting to the point now where designed intelligence can actually start being creative. And if you ask most people they are, you, to describe their work, they say their work is like art, because it requires creativity. Um, no job can ever be done twice the same. Um, but here we have a computer, which you'll give it the same image many times, and, and it won't give you the same, same output necessarily. Uh, this is uh, some work going on at MIT, but I don't want to show it to you. Yeah, there's no time. It's really interesting. It's, it's a different view on, on artificial intelligence, where they basically write a program, and the, comp the program balances a ball on a stick, and it gets given no information whatsoever. So that's intuitive learning. That's like how a baby starts to walk. Nobody tells the baby to stand up and start walking. It sort of just does it on its own. So a lot of our behavior as humans is innate. Uh, people don't realize this, but that's why we learn so quickly. Um, so is this happening? Are there actually machines taking jobs? I would argue yes. Uh, here we have labor productivity. So that's basically the output of people and the amount of people who are hired. And since 2002, labor productivity has gone right up. So the amount of goods we're producing, the amount of money we're, we're, we're creating, accelerating. And two recessions later, after the first idiots who, who helped Kevin lose his first job, uh, 2001 dot-com crisis, and then after that, the recession, uh, we see that there's a growing disparity there. So the world is getting richer, but it's not necessarily because we're employing more people. So this is just further iterates that. So here we have median income per, per person. It's re remained basically the same since 1975, this one would argue. And real G GDP per capita, that's taking a, the whole kind of GDP dividing it across the population, um, has gone up dramatically. So Ke Kevin said, uh, finished with a quote, I can't remember exactly what it was, but you, know, you have to make things happen and nothing happens overnight. Um, this is the psychological phenomenon why nothing happens overnight, although it appears that things happen overnight. Um, I, I, I'm standing on the shoulder of giants, I did not come up with this. But essentially, when a new technology is released, such as machine learning, you know, the first programs, machine learning programs were written 30, 40 years ago, you just get disappointment. You, you, you expect it to be Terminator, and instead what you get is a, a vacuum cleaner that knows how to avoid your cat, right? And so that continues for a long, long, long time, and suddenly we have exponential changes. And then you have chaos and amazement. What the heck just happened? It, it, it happened overnight. No, it didn't. 40 years, of, you know, your grandpa was working on it. But finally, the technology exists to make it happen. I really would argue strongly that we are close to this area here. I don't know. It's hard to say. But the technologies that drive artificial intelligence have become much more scalable through cloud services like AWS G Cloud, um, which allow me from my laptop to write a program that gets processed on 200,000 computers around the world. So traditionally, super intensive calculations can be done basically from your garage. So we're finally able to apply these programs, which have existed for a long time, to solve today's problems. I think this is where it gets uh, super interesting. Which jobs are at risk? Um, for the first time in history, white collar work is at risk. In the past, it's been, okay, well, the factory, you know, factory jobs are going to get uh, replaced by other machines. Well, that's okay. You know, it's blue-collar workers. Machine learning works differently. I mean, for example, this whole idea that robots are going to clean our streets is ridiculous. Have you seen images in, of, of MIT's robots recently? They can't open door handles. They'll fall over trying. So it's incredibly complex to build a humanoid robot. I don't think it will happen for some time. Think about battery technology, all the different technologies that go into making a robot. On the other hand, if you have somebody who sits at a desk the whole day and processes data, you can just install a program on their computer and theoretically they could do a large part of that job. So what jobs are at risk? Medicine, L lawyers, bankers especially. These are the jobs that our parents are telling us over and over and over again to go into. Yet I'm telling you, if you don't think carefully about what you want to do in life, if you don't think creatively and passionately, those are the jobs that follow the high risk area. What jobs might not be so risky? 
service-facing jobs, jobs that where you deal with people, jobs where you have to be creative, jobs where you have to think differently, or if you're super specialized. Because nobody's going to invest you know, millions of dollars to creating a program where they could just hire you to do it. So these are just some statistics that, I mean, you know, it's, it's good to be optimistic, and I think university was a great experience. I studied in the States for a while. 73% um, of students who leave college are unhapy with their, with their jobs. Sorry, that's the wrong statistic. Are working in unrelated degrees. So they, they study history and they go in consulting or something like that. So the education system today isn't necessarily helping people find what they're really good at. 40 to 100 million mainly white collar jobs will disappear in the next 10 years. The only barriers to that happening today are a political. In the world we live in, JDs expire daily. You know, it's really, really difficult to say to someone, this is your job, and this is what you have to do every day, and this is what you'll need to know, because that can change every day. Um, and some jobs will just go. And moreover, not only are you faced with this kind of situation as a student, you know, if you don't have the benefit of your parents paying for you, which is most Americans, it takes 21 years to pay your student loan back. So what's the answer to all of this? Uh, I, I don't know, um, frankly. I, I think it would be uh, super pessimistic and unlikely that humans will just become irrelevant as a species. But, and, I, and I do believe that there will be more jobs than ever. But how do we get from high school, wherever we are, university, to those jobs? And how do we get to them where the factors are no longer like what the company wants you to do, but what you actually want to do independently, where you could commit your time and your energy to be emotionally invested in the work you do. And it's more important than ever to be emotionally invested in the work you do. Previously, you didn't have to be that. You'd just be a banker or whatever, and you earn your money, and you live a different life on the weekends and whatever. But, but these days, if you don't have passion in your work, and I know it's a cliche, uh, you, you're very replaceable. You, you, know, you need to be incentivized to continually think about the areas and fields you're working in, the people you meet, how you apply you know, problem solving, to the challenges you face at your work, and passion is the number one guider uh, in, in achieving that. So, you know, I have one more, one more idea I'd like to share with you. Has, has anyone seen this? Actually, I, I gave a small talk here a while ago. I, I brought this a similar thing up. Raise your hands if you know what this is, sort of. So there's a guy called Eric Ries. He's famous in San Francisco, and he writes something called the Lean Startup Model. How do you go from starting a company to finding product market fit, a product people want to buy? And basically, you generate ideas, you, you, write, you write code to build those ideas out, and then you get data from them. Are people using it? Are they not? How are they using it? That sort of thing. And you learn from it, and then you generate new ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I propose we have to take a similar kind of view on education. We, can't say no, we can no longer say that education ends here and work starts here. We have to create a gradient where the two meet and cross over and where there are experiences to experience work whilst you're still in school, and you continue to learn while you're out of school. I think learning needs to be more continuous. And we need a rapid validation system where we have not 12 opportunities to test what we want to do in our lives, but hundreds, if not thousands, every day to try new things, to solve new problems, to be able to iterate and figure out what exactly it is we want to focus. So this sounds like an incredibly inefficient method. If I knew a better one, I would tell you. But through the process of trying new things and trying new things over and over and over again, we'll start to see what's good to us and what's not. And the more we do that, the better we understand how we work and what we enjoy doing. So the, the process, I would imagine, would be something like discovery, where you connect with lessons and content you want, you're interested in, mentorship and teachers. And I wouldn't, you know, in terms of jobs that are replaceable, I would put teachers as one of the last jobs that could be replaced. Because there's, so, there's such a high level of emotional involvement in working with students. And more importantly, machines will never be able to capture what will be important tomorrow. Machines are good at forecasting, but when they have a superb amount of data, rarely can they do anything on a really, really low level. So the role of teachers, I think, we need to emphasize more than ever in, in education. We need to you know, move away from curriculums and grades and, and pressures in that area, or at least optimize them, and focus instead on teacher-student relationships. Then we need to have a, a better way to measure our progress in grades. I don't know what that is. Uh, we're certainly experimenting things with my, my present company, but I think it's going to be much more about engagement and emotion. Are you connecting with the content you're learning? Uh, does it interest you? Does the work you have to do afterwards interest you, rather than when, whether you get an arbitrary A or not? I mean, there's, there's a guy I was speaking to the other day in Zurich, and he, he, he articulated it really well. We have this idea that everyone needs to get all these A's. Everyone has to get A's across the board, and that's how you succeed. 
But that doesn't tell you anything about what you're good at or how you specialize in today's economy. And it causes misery when you try to do things you don't like, you don't enjoy, you don't see the utility of. You might see the utility of them another day, but not today. So instead, we need, to, we need to treat failure as an intrinsic part of education. This is my limitation here. This is where I'll stop, and I'll focus instead on these areas I join. And those areas may take you back there eventually. But that seems like a much more organic and natural and emotional way to learn. Uh, so that, that's basically it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>